Jam 92 says, damn, okay, 49ers. Not even Paul Blart could help the Eagles. I guess Paul Blart yeah. is a security official. You don't even know who Paul Blart is. I don't, you know, wait. No, it's a mall cop. It's a movie. You oh, haven't seen it. I thought we'll that was the guy's that, name. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We're here to learn football. That's why you're here. We're going to talk football. You want to talk movie references? Don't talk to Ahmed Fareed. No, no idea. He's clueless. He really thought Paul Blart was an official security guard somewhere. He thought it was actually Dom DeSandro. He was like, damn, that's his real name, Paul Blart. There's Paul Blart, mall cop. You seen King of Queens ever? You ever seen that I have TV seen show? That, yep. It's a very good show. I would I would recommend it. And and your adult, you know, the the movie Mall Cup. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you and tell you I recommend that. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. So save your life. Yeah, there's way better movies that you haven't seen that you should start with. The name's even that. in the poster. Paul Blart Mall Cop. Right. Exactly. Right. And um, it just shows that there is a spot in the social world that is very prevalent to most people in the world yeah and not even on your radar not it's quite impressive all. like it's really impressive so there so do you there, even yeah. know who wins best picture at the oscars ever absolutely not. and you don't even watch the oscars no i don't wow no that's amazing there's just too much other stuff going on i was doing college basketball last night i gotta talk to you about nfl every you know <laughs> twice a week uh so this is i don't have time for for movies right now but it was funny uh by the way pete knows it got 34 percent on rotten tomatoes so you're right uh, don't, yeah it's don't not go good watch don't waste movie. your time don't waste uh, your I mean, time if you don't know who paul blard is you've actually saved an uh, hour and a half or two hours <laughs> saved of your life, your life. <laughs> um there were some people that that wrote me and, and tweeted or, or commented in they were like uh, i've lost respect for Ahmed. he didn't even know who paul blart was which i would say this if you lost respect for me because of that you're not a homie because you haven't been listening you should have lost respect for me a long time ago <laughs> right when it comes with to my, that with that's all right. this stuff you should know I by mean, this point this is the guy who watched like parts of the godfather and was like ah, eh, eh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it doesn't yeah. it doesn't stand the test of time oh is what I think gosh what I you're crazy you are crazy my my movie it was really long Pete, yeah. pete's right on that um yeah my movie takes are not good and you could argue my football takes aren't that good either ah, i think but. your football takes are great you're great it's good to be here it's wednesday december 6th we yeah. got football tomorrow yes it's real december football we got some good ones to talk about today we got lots of good subjects to break down today so yes we do we have uh what the App. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you just said, what the f? Ahmed just said a swear word and he didn't even mean to. It was supposed he to be. He was literally. Big. Oh my gosh. Can we play that back? Can no, you no, no, rewind no. that and play that again? I am. Uh, now we know. Th- I am getting a little. That I'm, like, is the getting... first time ever I've heard you swear in life. That's. Let alone you did it on a live microphone. Now that's yes. going to be the opening of our Sunday show. <laughs> yeah. Our Sunday podcast. Please make sure that is clipped off. He's embarrassed. Everybody who's just listening bit, out there. I'm a little hot. The cheeks are red. I'm a little hot. And right now. it was so. I. You might have actually snuck by if I didn't see your face. Yes. I like, should have just kept going. You, I would. Your face gave it away because I was kind of reading the rundown and like thinking of some things, and your face made me realize that you just said the f word. Oh my! God. What a f-ing idiot you I are! Know. I don't know how this. <laughs> I don't know how this happened. That'll never happen again. Yeah, sure. Um, but now, but hey, maybe now I broke the seal. Yeah, maybe you might now as well just let it fly. You're right. Now I we mean, just now we just go let ahead. It go. Give us another Kristen, one, Kristen. I'm sorry. No, I'm not going to do that. Actually, <laughs> uh, and, may, and maybe it was so slight, and I think I said it kind of quiet, so I don't even know if it showed up on on microphone. No, no, okay, we got it. We got it. Yeah, yeah. All right. Don't you worry. What the F happened uh, <laughs> on Wednesday here? Treasure Hunters. We're going to talk about the best coaching job. I might not recover from this, uh, to be quite you're honest You're stumbling with you. and stammering now. I might have to take like a 45-minute break here. You're just Ron here. Burgundy, and you read the uh, – <laughs> uh, you don't even understand that either. Yeah, uh, I've seen that movie. Okay, you have seen that? Yes, I'm yes. Ron Burgundy. You just you read the teleprompter no right. matter what. I am all thrown off. I'm going to blame this, though, to you know a late night last night. I yeah. said I was doing I was doing my basketball, uh, my basketball last right. night. And so as I was getting ready, it was like 15 minutes before we were going to go on. Yeah. Yeah. My Apple Watch starts like blowing up. Yeah. I'm like, okay, it must be a text from my, Look at from that my guy. wife. This Look at if you're watching on Peacock or YouTube, I'm just like, oh, let me let me check what's coming in on my watch. Love the tie shirt combo. Thank you. The purple, they, when they hook me up with purple, I feel like that might be my best Good color. Good color for you. Thank you. Um, but I, I'm looking at my watch. I'm like, what's happening here? That's like 13 buses in a row. And they were... The notes from Chris, if you're watching right now on Peacock or YouTube, you can see the on my watch, which is actually a, it's a decent-sized watch. It's unbelievable. And you can see the whole page there. Holy for, shit, big watch. What is watch. that? That is, uh, that's, that's Packers, Packers O versus Chiefs, Chiefs D. D. Right? People will be able to zoom in on that and read a little and bit. Pete, 
Pete texts, he's like, oh my God, do you actually look at the notes on your watch? And I don't, but I think I could make out a few words there. I, I think it actually is clear I think, enough. I think you could too. To where I could read some of the notes. Uh, no, that is not how I do my scouting, but I thought it was funny that all the pictures were showing up on my watch <laughs> as I was getting ready. Uh, so, so we've got all that information for you, and we will start with maybe the statement of the year so yeah, far. I think Pete sure. notes here, and I think that's a good way to put it. The 49ers defeating the Eagles. You looked at both sides of the ball on this one because we want to dive deeper. We don't just want to take what we saw from the TV copy, and you were doing Football Night in America while this game was happening right, anyway. Right. So you needed to sit down with pen, pad, notebook. Digest it and again. And digest this again. So yep. let's start with the 49ers offense and the Eagles defense. Let me start a little broad here, yeah, too. Yeah, go ahead. A lot of people made this about – you know, the 49ers just had just more rest. They were coming off nine days rest, a blowout win at Seattle. The Eagles, just six days rest. They had that overtime game against Buffalo. Sure. The defense had 95 snaps yeah. in that one. So, yeah. From Played what the you Chiefs s- the week before that on a Monday yes. night, right? Yes. I mean, they've had two physical long games. From what you saw from the film, were the Eagles, and now the defense has not been great this year, yeah. was the Eagles a little slower, sluggish? Was the rest a factor in this in your you mind? You know, I'm glad you brought it up, actually, because I, I saw some of that, too. And listen, you know, just rest a factor? Yeah, I mean, of course it is. I mean, we know that. I don't. I can't say that it looked like that on film. And as I think you told here, see from my notes, early on in the football game, it seemed like the Eagles were kind of the team that was fresh and flying around and like kind of like, hey, 49ers, how dare you come back in here and this be this, 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 this disrespectful for us? We're going to show you. And they controlled, we, as we know, the whole first quarter of the football game. So that's where it'd be hard for me to, you know, look at it and go, oh, man, that was, you know, a big, big effect on the football game. You know, as the game goes on, do they get tired, whatever? You know, I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, but but either way, it, it's been a tough stretch for them. I'm, I'm certainly aware of that, and it didn't, you know, it didn't help them, yeah. I will say. But I don't sit here and look at that and go, oh, that's the okay. main reason they lost the football game. I would give that excuse more to a Dallas Cowboy team who played last Thursday night to go, that was their third game in 11 days. Mm. I can understand why their defense maybe looked the way they did against the Seattle Seahawks. That, to me, would be more of an example than, you know, oh, we played – three games in a row that were tough, you know, Monday night, Sunday, Sunday, I'm not going to, you know, totally buy into that aspect there. All right, so then more of a factor was what the 49ers did offensively, and I've, I've read over your notes here, and you've been very complimentary, obviously, of, of Kyle Shanahan, not just because he's one of your good friends out there, because you love what he does in the NFL, and I think a lot of people see that. They crack the code. Yeah. In a lot of games. Yes. They were able to crack the code in this game. Right. By doing what specifically? Well, I think early on in the game, like we talked about, Philly dominated the line of scrimmage, right? I think Philly maybe came out and played a little bit more of a conservative nature on the defensive side of the ball at first. If, hmm. you, if you had to make me guess with how it looked, that I don't think the 49ers expected them to maybe play so many conservative coverages. They kind of played off, tried to keep people in front of them, almost like mm. they did against the Miami Dolphins. And I think that caught Shanahan and the company by surprise a little bit. They called some plays early on in the game that were kind of aggressive, and they were like, whoa, wait, they're all back there. There's nothing we can do here. There's nobody open, right? So there was an adjustment period there, you know, let alone, like I said, the Eagles, their fans, the look of the night, all that. They kind of came out looking like they were a little bit in the more motivated, we're going to send a message type of football team right at least at first I think it was you know it's that fourth drive or the yeah it was the fourth drive or the third drive maybe for the uh, uh, San Francisco 49ers where uh, they finally got into a rhythm and I think the big thing was gotten a rhythm with with just some short passes right let's just take what they give give us let's go from there and then that kind of opened up you know, Pandora's box to the rest of their offense. And they got the defense reeling a little bit. But, you know, I think the the thing that uh, I would say, you know, really got them going or, or the offensive thing that got them going o- overall, Purdy being efficient, making some big throws just to get it going. But then – they run game to the left, and then some game plan plays. Once Shanahan figured out how they were playing him, with especially their 21 personnel, two backs, one tight end, that really stressed Philadelphia out. And between the run and the package of plays that they have out of that personnel set, the 49ers are very hard to defend when they play 21 personnel. I'll get to that into that in a second. Yeah. But they slowly but surely started to have their way in almost all facets of, of offensive football. Let's get into it right now because yeah. it's 
something that you noted in your your notes: twenty one personnel, two running backs, one tight end, kind of like an old school. Right, right. You used to have like right. the the running back and the full back. It's how they used to play. Yes. Um, the 49ers use it in thirty seven percent of their offensive plays. It's got to be a league leader, second right? Most in the NFL okay. too. The Miami Dolphins. Oh, well, there you go. Do it 42% of right. the time. So, yeah, it, let's dive a little deeper into that. Like, yeah. why is that significant to you, and, and what do they do off of I, that? I think it's different than the Dolphins and what they do, and it's because of their personnel, right? When you talk about, let's talk about the two backs, the one tight end, and the two receivers, right? The two backs, first off, and McCaffrey and Juszczyk mm-hmm. are extremely uh, versatile. They can do everything. You know, we know they got Kittle, who's a good tight end, who, same thing, can do everything. Elite run game blocker, elite pass game catcher. And then you got the two receivers on the outside where, yeah, Ayuk is a traditional receiver, but Debo is, is he a running back? Is he a fullback? Is he a wide receiver? I mean, he does everything for their offense. So you play defenses going, oh, no, they're in two backs, one tight end. They're going to be able to run the ball on us. But they can get into it and go, well, now we're in 10 personnel. You know, which 10 personnel be one back, no tight ends. And what I mean by that is they can get in shotgun and go, hey, we're going to put everybody out at receiver. No backs in the backfield. And because all five of those guys can run routes like legit receivers, use check included. You know, he's really like a pass catching tight end who plays fullback and can do that almost like Kittle, but a different version of that. So they can do that, let alone that 21 personnel can look like one back, one tight end, three receivers, right? And they can play all these things off of each other that really put a defense in of a bind to go, wait, wait, they might run it and smash it down our throat, so we want to put an extra linebacker in there or an extra D lineman in there so we don't get overpowered, but then they spread the field out and they make the game fast and you go, oh, damn, I wish we could take one of these D linemen off the field and put a nickel back back in so we can cover Debo on the, you know, the swing passes or McCaffrey coming out of the backfield running, you know, go routes from the seam route or whatever, and that's where they really put teams in a bind mm. and make it very hard their versatility out of that personnel set is unlike anybody else in football. Run, pass, short run, sh- uh, short pass. Reverses, right? Oh, wait, Debo's in the backfield. They're not going to run the ball. McCaffrey's out there at receiver. Wait, they ran the ball between the tackles with Debo. We, we call the pass defense because they got in that formation, yeah. right? There's just so much they can do with it. Uh, and then, of course, they start moving around and the shifts and the motions and everything like that, which, again, this is a different scheme last year than last year's Eagles football team, but the motions and the shifts from the 49ers in this football game definitely affected the Philadelphia Eagles. It affected them not so much to where they were confused. There was definitely communication and some blown assignments, but also the the motions just, you know, whether they spread the field or got one guy out of the box so now McCaffrey could be one-on-one or Debo could be one-on-one with the linebacker over the middle of the field. The, The defense wasn't capable of making the proper adjustments. And between the motions and the shifts, Shanahan found a way to crack their code, as I like to say, uh, yeah. and go, wait, it's cover four, but now I'm going to move this guy there and this guy there, and now it's going to basically play like man-to-man, and it's going to be Morrow in the middle, man-to-man versus McCaffrey or Debo, like I said, and of course that's advantage 49ers. I think we have some visual evidence of some of this, at least. We have some screenshots of the plays, the first and third plays of the second touchdown oh, drive yeah, here. Yeah, right. What and does this, this is, show you? This is where they really got it rolling, right? They got the ball back, and you know, the the Eagles didn't capitalize on their early momentum like we talked about, right? Two field goal drives. They were up 6 nothing and got the ball back up 6 nothing with good field position, went three and out, and they had to punt the ball away, and then the 49ers went on the drive, and now here's the second drive. But you, you always hear me talking about, right, like, like – tying plays together, yep. right? And what that means and, and how that works and what an off, a good offense does are examples of it. So here's, here's the examples. But basically, okay, you're going to see here like the top screen, the top play is going to be end up being like a basically a little swing pass to Debo Samuel with lead blockers in front of them, right? And they are in a little bit of a different formation. But watch, I want to show this how this goes to give you an idea of where this plays. You see on the top, it's tight end to the right, right? It's McCaffrey and Debo Samuel also to the right, 
All right. And then Brandon Ayuk's on the backside and you can't see him there on the top of the screen. On the bottom, which is two plays later, it's the same formation just flipped around. OK, so let's let it play out, Pete, and let's uh, let's see that next screenshot. Then the, the, the one up top. Now, again, it's the same motion. Right. But Debo Samuel, yep. he kind of goes across the motion and then he turns back and he goes behind the quarterback. All right. So the play on the top, he's going to go behind the quarterback. And OK, as they do that, they're going to basically it's a toss sweep. Right. They took this play from the Miami Dolphins. The Miami Dolphins scored on this play in a touchdown. And he went, wait, that's McDaniel. I do all these motions. Why don't I do this play like the Miami Dolphins and start in, in, you know, putting in my offense? So so here you go. There you see it. It looks the same. Right. I'm a great play callers, great offenses. Yep. You know, it's the same look, but we're going to throw a curveball. It's a little window dressing and have you think all these different things. You got to communicate. Wait, they're going over here. It's going to be three receivers to one side. Oh, wait, now it's going to be a two by two. Oh, wait, wait, it's back. Now we're going to a four-by-one, right? So all these rules are making the defense change yeah. within this movement and these shifts. But if you saw the first play, you're just like, okay, this is just the mirror image of this play again here. Well, I, I, I saw the first this. play, and they got out on the edge, and Debo was like, he almost broke the last tackle, and he could have been gone for 60 yards. So that's in my brain. It was just two plays ago, right? So go ahead, Pete. Go to the next play, as you see, or the next screenshot. Now, the one at the top, you can see here, they McCaffrey, who was the receiver to the right, on the top. He's just sitting over the middle. Ayuk, who was on the top, he's sitting over the middle. And you can see now check is basically leading. Can you see him on the top of the screen there, yep, Ahmed? Yep. 44 is basically this is a toss sweep. A lead blocking for Debo Samuel. And it's almost a lateral. Uh, it is, ends up being a forward pass. But Purdy throws it out there. And Debo Samuel, you know, now is in space where check is going to block uh, Bradbury. And now it's like, oh, it's me and Hassan Reddick one-on-one as I shoot through a gap here. And, and I like my chances of Debo. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, so they saw that play and they went, whoa, you know, that's, a, that's an issue. And then you could see on the play below it, they do all the same stuff before the snap. They send Debo wide going the other way, but this time they change the route combinations. This time they go, wait, we think they'll see that Debo play. The linebackers will be over aggressive to go, wait, we got to get over to stop Debo, which they do if you look on the bottom of the screen there. Blankenship and the uh, middle linebacker, I think it's Stills in that one, 53, they overplayed the Debo Samuel aspect thinking, wait, I just saw this two plays ago and they gashed us, right? I got to get over there and help out. And this time they go, no, we're going to send Kittle across the field and he's going to be wide open and Brock Purdy hits him. So that's what I'm talking about when you talk about tying plays together, setting things up, you know, uh, making things look the same, but they're a little different. And that's where Shanahan's amazing, not only with the window drive before the plays, the movements that stress you out there, but yeah. playing plays off of each other. Right. Let alone the play that they ran in between those two plays was a run to the left, which he was also setting something up for that to come down the road, right? And so that's where it is. Oh, we're going to run left. We're going to run left. And then, as I told you later in the game, what's he do? He gets down close to the end zone. They've been crushing him with the run left. He goes, wait, tight end shift left. Wait, are you going motion left really fast? Wait, we're going to fake the run left to Christian McCaffrey. And then I'm going to toss the reverse to Debo Samuel. He's going to run around the right side for a touchdown. And that's where Shanahan's next level with that type of stuff. Let's show that because I think that was something that uh, in your notes you didn't expect to see necessarily the amount of times they ran to the left. Yes. The amount of times they ran to the left before they even ran to the to the right. And in total, by the end of the game, they had run left 17 times, just right five times. Here. Right. And uh, I think the, en- the end of the game was like the, the most m- of most those. of the right hand if, right runs. If right. Not, if right. not all of them there. Um, so so. Yeah, what what do you make of that? The fact that obviously that you got Trent Williams on that left side too. You feel like the stronger you go. side of your, That's your exactly offensive right. line. There you go. You can set up a reverse later on in the game or something to the other side once you've done that. But uh, seventeen to five, that does seem lopsided more so than usual. It is. I think it's the, your point though. I think is correct. I think he just went, wait, this is these dudes. These dudes on Philadelphia are r- legit. Like if we want to run the ball, I want to run the ball behind my best people where I feel like we can be successful, right? And between Trent Williams, the left tackle, and Aaron Banks, their left guard, who's a road grader, 
and you know went to Notre Dame and was that guy there and, and has been good at smash mouth football all along, I think they looked at that and just said, hey, if we're going to run the ball against this group, let's just run behind our best football players here. And they had, a, of course, little different ways in which they ran left and made things happen, but I think it was as simple as that. I don't think, you know, there's no reinventing the wheel or like, man, what was the other reason they could be doing this? Was the defensive line on that side weaker? No. no there was no telling who was going to be on that side of the defensive line or what personnel was going to be on there. They just went, we're going to run, run behind our best horses here yep. and Williams and Banks, and we'll go down fighting with our best punches and we'll see where it goes. And, of course, they had their way and they continued to find little ways and the C gap, you know, basically between the tight end and the left tackle to find little ways to open up holes that, again, it's not the same run every time. It looks a little different, but there's a little tweak to it. Mm -hmm. So the defense goes, oh, we got killed this way one time. All right, we got to overreact. And then they have something else that it looks the same, but it's a little different. They go, oh, damn, he now they hit it through a little bit of a different gap. And that's where the 49ers really become tough. The Eagles linebackers, right? They're, they're not very talented. It's a team of all-stars. It's, it's by far their weakest position on their football team. And Shanahan found ways to put pressure on them the whole game. That was one thing I think we got to hit. And, and to add on top of that, not only is it their weakest position, as you know and I watch things, I go, they're also being put in sometimes the most schematically hard position where I want to go, the biggest flaw on the defense is with – the guys that are your worst players on your defense, you, you can't let that go down. That's got to be, you got to hide that to a degree. You can't just go, hey, we're awesome everywhere else against an awesome team and go, hey, they won't find a way to expose that. And, you know, of course, Debo and some of the other passes and the runs and the reverses and all that tested the linebackers' communication, adjustments. And, you know, they were put in some tough spots where I go, you know, I don't want to blame Nicholas Mora. I want to go, that is a really tough spot you were put in. Uh, it's like cover the receiver or cover McCaffrey. Cover the receiver or, oh, no, it's Debo Samuel. I'm stuck in a tough spot here, and that's not him. You know, he's being going to put it in a spot that's not realistic for him to succeed. Yeah, any, any linebacker who has to cover Christian McCaffrey, that is an unfair Right, well, unfair they, there's matchup. another good play of, you know, they, they get in a formation, they get the look they think they want, they motion – McCaffrey out of the backfield where he just goes sideways even though they're in the shotgun. He doesn't go to the line of scrimmage at all. He shuffles, but it's really just to clear out the picture a little bit for Purdy and the offense altogether. So now he goes, wait, he's kind of shuffling sideways. Look, the linebacker's shuffling with him, right? And now we've opened the field a little bit to make this read and even the space in which McCaffrey can cut. Is he going to go inside? Is he going to go outside? Is he going to go straight? There's more space. And so now the linebacker's like, oh, well, you shit. I got no chance here. And of course, that's how they make big plays. And that's where, you know, the 49ers are next level and amazing that way. So the linebackers for the Eagles stuck out to you a little bit being put in those Difficult situations, not always succeeding. The cornerback stuck out for some people out there, including Eagles Hall of Famer Seth Joyner. Did you see this? Oh, I, I did see a little of this. Let me, let me hear so this. So he said yeah. after the game, he's a local analyst now for right. the Eagles. Right. He said after the game, our cornerbacks are as disinterested at tackling as someone uh, someone as a young kid coming out to play football <laughs> for the first time. Um, so he threw that out there. He was he was ripping on on the the aggressiveness and toughness of some of those corners, and uh, the corners didn't like that, including yeah. Darius Slay. Yeah, well, he shouldn't. clapped back on Twitter, and uh, and Eagles fans um, um, saw this and said it was talking out of the side of your neck, is what Darius Slay tweeted out there to uh, this legend, this Hall of Famer, and Seth Joyner. The funny thing is, and Pete noted this to me before we started talking about it, Eagles fans of the mentions were like, no. Darius, you guys were not good. You guys did not tackle that well. No. To the point where Darius Slay had to come out and be like, hey, everyone, just chill, chill out a bit here. I realize that. We didn't play that well. Um, but what did, you, what did you see from the – was it was it that they were not disinterested in tackling I, at I, I all? don't think that. I don't think that. I didn't look at it and go, oh, they were not interested. Or they, you know, again, it's a rare dude wearing number 19 in white and red. It's a rare, rare dude. He makes a lot of DBs look like they don't want to tackle or they're not aggressive – all the time. I did not watch the film and go, there was reluctance for them to make this tackle or do that. Mm -hmm. You know, they were well thought out plays where a lot of the times the corners had nothing to do. Darius Slay, like when he's chasing down Debo Samuel on the 48 touchdown yard, touchdown pass down the middle, it's not because of lack of aggressiveness. I mean, damn, he hustles, he runs them down. Debo carries him for like four yards. I mean, 
Again, it wasn't because he was like, oh, no, I want to lightly jump on your back so you can keep running. He tried. He tried to swipe hard to hit the ball. I mean, Debo is a load. If people saw Debo Samuel, if some of the Eagles fans who were on Darius saw Debo, I'd go, I'll give you a million dollars, Mr. Eagles fan. Tackle Debo right now. Let's see how that goes for you. All right? So that's where, let alone he was in space. He's quick as hell. He accelerates as hell. And a lot of the times, too, he had blockers in front of him where the DBs are trying to take on a block and tackle him at the same time. So I don't look at it like that at all. Um, I just look at it as, yeah, they were in some tough spots and the 49ers were motivated and they had to tackle a guy that yeah. we know is like, you know, a handful when it comes to that. And there were some players that stood out to you on that Eagles defense. What did you like about Nolan Smith? A couple of the young guys here. Their edge Nolan Smith and their safety Sidney Brown. I, they just, they to me need to be infused into the lineup a little bit more. You know, they throw them a bone here and there just to go, hey, young guys, get in there. You're good. But, you know, I don't know if they don't trust them or yet or whatever. But to me, those are guys when I see them on the field, they, they pop out for the Philadelphia Eagles, you know? I'm sure they're not as smart as some of the older guys or whatever else, but they add an element of an explosiveness to their defense that, you know, brings them up another level. And, you know, all the talk about their safety play anyways, you know, Brown can fly and flies around like a kamikaze, just like his brother did as a Cincinnati Bengals running back the other night, as you saw, right? So I, I think they, they need to find a way. And, and Nolan Smith is just he's, – he's just a freak of nature, you know, the way he can take on blocks, rush the passer, whatever. You know, he'd be the guy, if I had to play the 49ers again, I'd have him on the field more. When we talk about 21 personnel, they're going to get big or they're going to get fast. When you got a guy like Hassan Reddick and Nolan Smith on the field, that'll combat some of that 21 personnel stuff we talked about. But really, when it all said and done, once the, the 49ers got in a little rhythm there on that first touchdown drive, Shanahan figured out how they were playing them. And slowly but surely got to plays and got the Eagles in situations and in coverages that he kind of had a feel, wait, they're going to do this right here. Yeah. And then, of course, they packaged together the right plays with that. And they couldn't be stopped. The Eagles, there was nothing they could do. You know, the Eagles D-line could not overpower the 49ers on that side. You know, and the Eagles... You know, playing their zone coverages for the most part, yeah, it was just too comfortable for Purdy and Shanahan. And that's where I've, we've talked about in the past. The Eagles need to find a way to just trick it up a little bit, a little more illusion. I'm not saying they got to reinvent the wheel, but like I said, there's too many times, and I, you know, I talk to people sometimes, they go, well, the Eagles, they run every coverage in, under the book. And I go, I know, but they line up in it. You know what it is, right? Like, you talk, like we talk about every week, I like the defenses who don't let the quarterback know what they're getting until they say set hut, and then they yeah. look up and they go, oh, crap, it's that coverage. It didn't look like that before the snap. And to me, they make the, the opposing team quarterback a little too comfortable at times I mean we've talked about the similarities between Kyle Shanahan what he does and Mike McDaniel what he does Mike McDaniel got a lot of the stuff that he does because he was with Kyle Shanahan for right. so long right. they, they did a pretty good job against the Dolphins they just gave up 17 points in that week seven win so why did they have more difficulty with the 49ers because of the traditional run game right they could beat the crap out of the Dolphins up front. So they didn't worry so much about the run game. They were like, we, we, we're okay there. We don't have to put five D linemen in against the Dolphins. We're good. The 49ers, they went, ooh, we could get out physical. They could gash us in the run game. We got to worry about that. So we got to take a guy out of coverage or be a little more ag aggressive with our fronts there. And that's the big difference uh, as far as the output of, of the difference of the offenses. Shanahan's offense and McDaniel, you're totally right, are very similar. It's just McDaniel's is a little bit more through the, the, the pass game and the speed of his football team. Shanahan, of course, is speed and has a pass game, but it's still premised on – the physicality and the Shanahan run genius, and then he does the other stuff off mm. of that. You know, McDaniel's doing it off of pass genius, pass genius, pass genius. Oh, you're taking away the pass. Here's a toss crack or something out, and we're going to get Marhi Mostert out on the edge and do that. So it's a little different way in how the approach is. Got it. Uh, yep. Before we turn the page to the other side of the ball, we do yeah. have to talk about Brock Purdy because he shot up the MVP he should. odds for a lot of people out there and a lot of the sports books out there. And when you look at his numbers, you know, people say, oh, it's a dink and dunk. And there were so many yards after the catch in this game specifically for him because Debo Samuel, Sam 
Jamie Oval so tough yeah. to take down. Right. Um, passes of 20 yards or more downfield this season. He has an NFL high 63% completion percentage. So when they do throw deep because of scheme and because of him and because he of the wide it. receivers, they do hit it. Um, but his longest attempt versus the Eagles in this game was just 16 yards downfield. When you look at Brock Purdy in his game on film, what'd you see? Well, I think that was one by design. They did not want, you know, they learned their lesson in the NFC Championship game. Try to throw the ball deep down the field. Brock Purdy gets crushed and hit by Hassan Rinnick and might not be playing, right? So they weren't going to, you know, tempt fate too many times with that, right? So I think that's the first thing. But Purdy was magnificent. I mean, he really was. And even though none of the throws were, you know, down the field or highlight reel-ish type throws, some of the throws regardless were big-time throws, you know, whether – like I told you, some of the out routes early to Ayuk to kind of get them going. Yeah. There was a 21 to 13, third and seven. He throws like a 12 yard out route. It's like, ooh, it kind of feels like the Eagles might have got momentum here. If the 49ers don't convert this, they're going to punt it back to the Eagles. Yeah. The Eagles just drove down the field and scored. You know, uh oh, are we getting into this Eagles come back in the second half type of thing here? And he throws an out route, right? Big pressure moment. Elements not great on the money. First down allows them to keep the momentum you going. You call that as play of the day. I think it was the play of the day. I think that was the play of the day as far as the Eagles were kind of doubting themselves. They went, oh, wait, wait, we do belong. We're back in this. Here we go. The fans were going crazy and everything. And that was kind of like, whoop, nope, nope. We're going to continue marching down the field on you. Get ready for that. You know, this assault is not done. And I do think that was the play of the day as far as the 49ers were concerned to keep their momentum, squash the Eagles' momentum, and, and, and of course, just stomp on the Eagles' throat there as the game went on. All right, let's flip it over to the other side of the ball here because it was the Eagles that were – dominating early on you mentioned it on Sunday night you mentioned it earlier here but they were just getting field goals instead of touchdowns and then it fizzled out yeah a little bit the right. 49ers made it very difficult yeah. on them um with your deeper dive what did you see that maybe you didn't expect to see or, or that tells the story of why the Eagles had it harder against yeah. this 49ers well, defense? I, I think early on they moved you know they moved the ball third down conversions the big thing and the shock to me is two things especially early on the 49ers played a lot of man early on. They usually don't. You hear me talk about it all the time. The 49ers don't like to play man. That's not what they are. They're not real good at it, right? They don't have those type of corners. That's not what they do. But they came out in this one and played a significant amount the first two, three drives of the football game where I was kind of like, whoa. you know. And I was sitting there going, like, why? I don't understand it. Like, why would you do this? But you know, I, I think hearing some of their postgame comments and then – Thinking about the game big picture wise, I think it was two things. One, you know, they weren't going to let the Eagles run game start getting off on them early in the game. You know, Eagles start running the ball, and then you're so worried about the run. A little bit like we talk about the 49ers. Now play action pass, Hurts run game works, all of it. And you're like, oh, no, our heads are spinning. So they wanted to squash that. I think the other part of that is they wanted to squash Hurts scrambling. They didn't want him to get in a rhythm and start making the game this scramble fest to where he feels like he's going to run all game. So I think they put an, aspect, uh, you know, a, an added emphasis on early in the game, they're not going to run. Hurts isn't going to run around on us. If he hits us and beats some passes man-to-man, then so be it. But I think they were willing to live with that rather than, you know, oh, oh my gosh, there goes Swift 20 yards up the middle. There goes Swift 20 yards off the right. Oh, Hurts, you know, scrambled and got 15 yards. That is when the Eagles become a real pain in the ass. And I think that was the reason we saw that early on. We've talked much about, you know, what Jalen Hurts can do, what he cannot do, uh, some of his limitations, some of the things that he's gotten better at and yeah. reading defenses yeah. and making the right play. Right. From, from watching the film on this, what are still like the main areas of improvement for Jalen Hurts moving forward? We've what hit on do? this. He's playing real good football. We yeah. know that, right? Am I shocked that he's still in the MVP conversation? A hundred percent. I don't I don't understand that. I'm just going to say that, okay? I mean, it's, a, it's one of the league leaders in turnovers, right? One of the league leaders in sacks with the most time to throw in all of football, right? right? And you've heard me say the last few weeks, there's some bad habits being performed here right? I'll even look the play he got hurt on. There was people open. I don't know why he ran, right? He just sees a lane and he runs. And I go, step up in the pocket. You know, I think it was Zacchaeus on the right side is up the seam. He's wide open for a 20 yard completion, right? He's tempting the, the fate of the football gods a little too much. 
You know, I know we look at it and go, oh, he ran for five, but I want, I, there's a lot of plays lately where I've gone, yeah, but there's a completion open for 20. That was a great run for five, but if he just stayed in the pocket, he's going to throw a completion for 20 yards. So I feel like there's a little bit too much backyard football creeping into his game mm-hmm. right now. Mm-hmm. That would be my one complaint. And I think he left a few plays on the field, you know, because of that the, the other night. You know, we've seen him in the past be able to, you know, make the right reads and he and, makes the right reads a lot of the yeah. times. I think he's just like maybe putting a little too much pressure on himself to make plays, get things going. Their offense hasn't quite been the machine that we've known it to be, especially compared to last year, right? I think there's a little bit of that, you know. Um, but but yeah, it was a weird one too because as you saw from my notes. I've never seen anybody block the 49ers front like that in my life. I mean, you know, some of the sacks he took, he had plus seven seconds to throw the football, right? And they were in bad moments. You know, the, 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 the six nothing, right? On second down, he lost 15 yards. It was, I want to say, like thir- second and seven. That took about their chance to go make it third and short and run it on third and short and then tush push. We get the first down. Maybe we score a touchdown, right? You know, so there's just a handful of plays like that where it's still really good. But I've yeah. said it against Kansas City. I said it against Buffalo, and I'd be not fair to my evaluations to tell you again that yes, there's a little bit of that creeping into his game right now that he's got to clean up. Let alone two, they are too pass happy. They are too pass happy, right? What did I write at one point? They were up six nothing and they threw the ball eleven plays, ten out of eleven plays out of that. The next, like, where's the run game? You know, so I didn't understand that. But after those first two drives, and them moving the ball down, the 49ers got out of that man to man and kind of got back to what they normally do, which is their Seattle threes, their cover fours, and their other creative little zones that they like to run behind that great front four. There's a couple of things here too, and the 49ers had to blitz a little bit, third down blitzes later in the game, I think too, and the Eagles actually were quite successful on converting some of those third downs. When but they, they were- played man or blitzed, the Eagles won. That is that, and that's what happened on the first few drives. I mean, early on in the game, I think they were like, you know, five for five or six for six on third downs, right? It was because of what you were talking about. It was blitz. It was man to man, and he was like, "Wait, it's AJ Brown on this guy. Boom, I'm gonna hit him. What's Devontae Smith on that guy? Boom, I'm gonna hit him. He's better than your guy." And those were great. <clears throat> those were the right plays all the way. But they might have felt like they had to do that as the game went on because I, I think that was one of the more surprising things. As you said, that Lane Johnson just shut down Nick Bosa. I've never seen anybody do that to their D line, and I've never seen anybody do what Lane Johnson did to Nick Bosa, right? And there's a bunch of plays, too, where Nick Bosa comes in speed to power, and he kind of moves Lane Johnson. You're like, oh, whoa, he's going to push him back into Jalen Hurts. And Lane Johnson just goes and stops him, like in his tracks. You're like, what? Hmm. What kind of human are you? Because I've seen Nick Bosa in person, and I don't think there's a human on earth that can stop him when he wants to run as hard as he can. And that was the incredible aspect of the football game. But, you know, the 49ers with their coverages, you know, and how well they are and, and the way the, four, the Eagles attack, which I tell you again, you know, is not as creative as it was last year when they had Shane Steichen. You know, they don't have as many answers in the past game as they used to. And I think that's one of the problems of the, their offensive efficiency as well. 49ers now going to take on the Seattle Seahawks. 49ers won 31-13 just a couple weeks ago. Um, it's not like the Seahawks are playing that much better since then, although they had a, a shootout with the Dallas Cowboys last time we saw them. What are your thoughts going into that one? Well, I, you know, I, I think the 49ers are rolling, and I think the Eagle, I mean, the Seahawks are reeling. So one team's rolling, the other one's reeling, and I think it's a bad matchup for the Seahawks. Ooh. I don't see a lot of avenues in which they can pull an upset other than, like, Purdy throws a dumb interception or two. McCaffrey fumbles. You know, maybe they get a strip sack, right? It's going to take something like that. If the game's played on relatively even terms, the 49ers are going to win that football game. They're just – they're too good. And between the struggles of the Seahawks on the red zone or third down – you know, those aren't good things with the 49ers because they thrive in that type of stuff. And then for the Eagles, maybe, maybe our biggest game on Sunday night this year. Yeah. You got the 10-2 and two Eagles facing the 9-3 and three Dallas Cowboys. You mentioned the Seahawks are reeling. Maybe the, the Cowboys, maybe this is their time. 
this is their time. It's it's to if they want to get it, it's now, right? Eagles are not playing their best football. You know, you just talked about how they were exhausted going to this game. Now they're going to go into another game just like it, right? I mean, they've played three battles in a row. And now they're going to Dallas, who has had this marked on their calendar, and they like to play at home and all of that. The big thing is going to be this, as we always talk about with this matchup. Can Dallas's speed disrupt the size of the Eagles? They are always compromised when they play the Eagles and the 49ers because they get pushed around up front, and they have to relegate more people to stopping the run game or stopping the front, and it causes issues for them everywhere else. We'll see if they can stand up to it. We'll see. The offense is hitting on all cylinders in Dallas right now. The Eagles defense, as you said, every week is kind of getting torn apart right now. Josh Allen tore them apart, right? Isaiah Pacheco tore them apart the week before that. The whole 49ers team tore them apart last week. So they got them real and certainly uh, going to be interesting to, to, to see how it plays out. But, yeah, the uh, Eagles are still really good. There's just some things. Hurts can play cleaner. They can be more patient with the run game. They need to trick it up on defense a little bit. I think they're a little too bland and simple at times, and I think that'll go a long way. We'll see where they go from here. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. And, and, you know, yeah, that, that's it. I, I'm good. That's it. Yeah. We've put a I think period. So. I don't think Close I missed anything else, did I? No, that was it. That yeah. was I, th- I think that was most of it. If anything comes to mind, we yeah. can say it as we go on here. All right, cool. Um, so yeah, the, the Cowboys are three and a half points favorites uh, at home. Wow, three and a half. The Eagles. That's yeah, significant. That's a, that is a little surprising. Yeah. Uh, in our game of the year on Sunday Night Football on NBC. Uh, all right, you looked at other games. You did deep dives into some of these other games. We're going to look at these in the context of Coach of the Year because we we wanted the homies to chime in too. Who are their Coach of the Year candidates? Maybe give us a top three. And so the homies in droves have done that so we're going to talk about a lot of these coaches cool. what they've done well what your thoughts of what they've done well yep we'll uh, we'll start with with toast leonard five who <laughs> like gave it. us his uh his why'd you laugh his. oh to- i thought you said toast i don't it's know what toast. is it toast? toast toast leonard five tochi maybe tochi? yeah tochi leonard five I was like, oh, no, is this another mall cop that I don't know who is in a movie? I was like, this is someone I should know. Uh, I'm not going to swear. I'm not going to do that. I've, I've done that for, uh, for my time for the podcast. Um, he has Kyle Shanahan number one for his Coach of the Year candidate. Brock Purdy is the favorite, quote, unquote, he put here for MVP. I'm not sure anything else more needs to be said. He goes number two, D'Amico Ryans. Many assumed he would be the worst team in the AFC, and they're sitting 7-5. and five. And he goes, number three, Dan Campbell or Mike McDaniel. Figured they would be good, but still needed to prove it. So we'll hear from some of the other homies here who chime in. But we just talked about Kyle Shanahan and all the things they're doing offensively with the San Francisco 49ers. He's his number one candidate right now. And I, I would bet you, for a lot of people out there, as we look at the DraftKings sportsbooks, it often doesn't go to the guy like Kyle Shanahan. You see his odds here, plus 2,000, because much was expected of the San Francisco 49ers. I, I get it. But, but, but when the much wasn't expected from the 49ers, Kyle didn't get any love there either. I, I don't know. He's one of those guys that for some reason, because he doesn't talk to the media, you know, you know, off camera or anything like that. His hats that he wears doesn't look like I, a coach. Well, yeah, or he's like not a, a political coach out guy. There. He's not into all of that. I think that goes against him. Like a, a little bit what went against him and why he didn't get a head coaching job quite as quickly as he probably should have. His name is Shanahan. They think like his dad's still calling plays, you know, from his home in Denver somewhere. Like, hey, Kyle can't really be doing that. Let me just say this right off the bat. The best head coach in football is Kyle Shanahan, and I don't really think it's close right now. Okay, that's what I'm going to tell you. Now, you can look at his coaching tree, which there's a number of them on this graphic. Okay, that speaks to it. The GMs he has around football, right? I mean, you go through it. I mean, last year, why didn't he win last year? Did, was everybody expecting them to go to the NFC Championship game with a Mr. Irrelevant, right? Why didn't he win it the year they went to the Super Bowl? They came out of nowhere and were the number one seed in the NFC playoffs with Jimmy Garoppolo. Why didn't he win it then? Jim Harbaugh won it with a team that he went to the playoffs with the year before. I mean, what? So that's where I don't understand the whole thing. I'm going Shanahan one. I've changed my thought. Shanahan is in, also has his hand in on the defensive side of the ball. As you've heard me say, this is the Shanahan defense. Steve Wilkes comes in and learns how to run their defense. He doesn't come in and go, hey, I want to do this. Now they go, no, this is what we do. You learn how to do it and go from there, and you can tweak with it and play with it a little bit, but this is what we do here at the 49ers. I'm Kyle Shanahan. I run this organization, yeah. right? 
So I am. Um, it's a really unbelievable year. Yeah. Let, is, let me let me read right? the, the odds ahead. one sorry. more time. I here ranted case... there and I didn't really no, mean good. to do that. I'm no, that's sorry. Good. But um, it was whenever you passion. choose to rant on this podcast, we will let that happen every time, <laughs> ten times out of ten times. Uh, Dan Campbell is the favorite right now, according to DraftKings, at plus two hundred. Well, we all thought they were. I thought the expectations. Everybody expected him but to do this. But we never really think the oh, Lions see, this are going to be oh, as good. Now it's we that. never I really know. Listen, think. he deserves to be here right up where at the top. I'm not, I'm not against that. This is like a, a like one of those career achievement awards, right? It's like what he's done and built over the last three years have culminated I into what the team is sure. right now because they're sure. not in this spot with, with Dan Campbell. And I know that's not the award, right? Yeah. It's about what you've right. done this year. Right. But I think maybe that is the story for Dan Campbell is that what well, he's done over the past I, I, three years, building a culture you. the second half of last year. No doubt about it. I, uh, I no doubt about it. He deserves to be every bit at the top of this conversation. In fact, all the guys that are at the top here deserve. I mean, D'Amico, D'Amico Ryan's, Ryan's number two. Right? You got Mike McDaniel three. Shane Steichen from the Colts is is four. And then you get into the longer shot odds with the guys like Sirianni, Shanahan, and Matt Lafleur. It's a, an incredible year. I mean, Matt Lafleur is another guy I could argue goes. Well, why didn't he ever get credit or get? Why didn't he win the job? It was all Aaron Rodgers. I mean, Aaron Rodgers. I thought they were ready to get rid of him, and all of a sudden they go thirteen and three and wins the MVP, and they're like, "Oh, it's not Lafleur. It's 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 Aaron Rodgers." And then they do it again, and it's like, eh, "It's not Lafleur. It's Aaron Rodgers." I mean, so I don't understand it. O'Connell and what he's done with the quarterback situation's insane. Sean Payton's insane, right? You know, I mean. All those guys, I think, except the two in the middle, Sirianni and Shanahan, have exceeded expectations, right? Mm-hmm. And and I would say, with the way the 49ers are playing and looking clearly like the best team in football, you know, and Sirianni and the Eagles kind of going through a tough spatch, that's where I would I would definitely have Shanahan ahead of him right now. All right, but I'm going to be on the unpopular one and say Shanahan should be one because I'm just sick of kind of the BS around this conversation too. You want to give it to the guy you think is the best coach. If right we're now not going to give him to in the other years where he exceeded expectations, how about we give it to him in the year where he's actually the actual best coach in football? Right. That's all I'll say. Now my number two will be Mike McDaniel. That would be my number two. You know, and I got I know the Dolphins had expectations, but come on. I mean, one, they're the number one seed in the AFC right now. Two, they're revolutionized, revolutionizing the offense like we talked about a few weeks ago. I mean, they're number one in like every offensive category in football. I mean, they're, they're incredible. So that is who I would make too, let alone, hey, like you talked about with Dan Campbell, he resurrected Tua and like a little bit of what he did last year should go into this year. All right. Then, you know, that's where I get into then now the – D'Amico Ryan, Dan Campbell, Shane Steichen conversation where I want to go, wow, it's really close right there. All right. So that that's where I think if I had to pick the third one, it would be D'Amico Ryan's. Mm. Right. That would be my third. If you really were like, but damn, I don't say that lightly out of disrespect for Dan Campbell and all the things you said are totally correct. Or what Shane Steichen is doing where, one, they look better with a rookie quarterback than we expected. And then we're like, oh, the rookie quarterbacks hurt. That stinks. They're not going to be as good. And you go, oh, whoa, they're in the playoffs right now uh, with Gardner Minshew. So incredible coach. It's a really, really tough year. As tough as I can ever remember with – you know, the quality of coaches we got right now in the NFL. It's going to be fascinating. We're yeah. going to talk more about this, but I want to let you know that you should not forget that on DraftKings Sportsbook this season, new customers can bet $5 and pocket $150 in bonus bets instantly. Plus, all customers can get a no-sweat same-game parlay every day. You can download the app, use the promo code UNBUTTON when you sign up. DraftKings Draft Sportsbook. Sportsbook. The, the crown, crown is yours. So whenever we talk betting, we, we got to bring Somebody up our- won millions today because of what? you. What? They bet millions that you would swear, <laughs> and they won today. What were the odds on that? Oh, <laughs> my gosh. It was one in a million. It, was, they bet, it would. They bet $1, and, and now every day, DraftKings has to pay them a million dollars. Every day, a homie just put $1 on it. Because you like, slipped up. It's going to happen one day. He's going <laughs> to slip up. So I'm just, every day, I'm going to put a dollar on it, and they've lost a lot of money up to this point. How many podcasts have we done here, Pete? This is five... They lost five hundred and sixty one dollars every day just betting on it. And now finally they get the million dollars. They got Congratulations it. to you. Um, but whenever we talk betting, we gotta bring it up our friend uh, NBC betting analyst Jay Croucher because he's kinda like the uh the the betting whisper on stuff like this. Like yeah, he often of sees before everyone else he's who, amazing. who will be trending and who right. will be talking about right. by the end of the year. Right. And so he has listed for Pete here his top five coach of the year candidates in terms of likeliest to win. Now these are not the guys that he thinks should win or whatever. He thinks these are this likeliest gonna happen. to win. Right. I'm shocked a little bit by his number one. His number one, Shane Steichen mm. for the Indianapolis Colts. Mm. I think a little bit of 
you know, how it ended last year, Frank Reich, right? Like, how good can they possibly be? Their offensive line looked like it was on a decline last year. You know, the quarterback situation, like we talked about. Secondary doesn't have any marquee players. I mean, I, I totally understand him being every bit at the top of this list, like, like I talked about. This is, this is where it's tough. D'Amico Ryan he has as number two, Dan yep. Campbell three, Mike McDaniel four, and then Matt LaFleur. Wow. Because if they get hot and make a run here without yeah. Aaron Rodgers, yeah. finally he gets the credit You're Exactly right. that he deserves. Yeah. Um, Jay also notes that the Texans play the Colts in week 18, perhaps the first ever Coach of the Year Bowl. That's like amazing. Like the winner of that game, who knows, goes to the playoffs right. and gets Coach of the Year. Um, that 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 could be that could be true. Um, now, I mean, if they win and they both oh one goes in and they they get in at nine and eight, like I, I th- that's not coach of the year material, yeah. right? And that could very easily happen with these two teams here. So we'll see how this plays out these last five weeks. Uh, Jay is always giving his betting analyst. He goes in depth on these awards just about every day with Drew Dinsick on Bet the Edge. You can get that wherever you download your podcast. And look at that. They're two nice-looking gentlemen. They're awesome, too. dudes. They're all over the sport. They got lots of great football thoughts. And, of course, they're all over anything, betting, lines, having a feel for the market, the public, what they're doing. Drew and Jay are awesome human beings, let alone awesome sports colleagues, information, betters. I don't know. what is What is, the, what is their – they're, they're sharps. I yeah. was gonna say, what is their classification? What sharps, do you call them? I guess. Are they whales? Right. Is whale? Is that? Oh yeah, and whale it's, cappers. It's, Drew's sharp, Twitter it's sharps, though, right? Sharp is the one that like can move an odd. Because I think of, like, I this always thought it was a shark. Ooh. Are they both? I don't. I don't know. I mean, I'm Chris Sims and famous for Simsisms and mixing things up. I've but heard them both in the. That you have heard gambling them. Gambling. I thought realm, it was one yeah. of those. Maybe I just been calling it wrong the whole time, thinking people were calling it sharks, and then people are saying sharps, and I just thought. And then sharp sharks and whales too, right? That that applies to the whales are the big betters, right? Yeah, right, right. But maybe sharks aren't really involved. And the and fish are the were. ones that actually get their money taken in poker. I do know that. <laughs> wow, it's a lot wow, of. Look uh, at you. Doesn't know movies, creatures. but knows how to bet. A lot of sea creatures. Look I know about the guy. sea creatures and which ones uh, pertain to gambling and which ones do not. Um, so, yes, we've already gotten into a lot of the names here, but you tweeted out to the homies. I mentioned this already. Uh, who are your top three Coach of the Year candidates right now and why? Can I give you mine? Yeah, of course you can. So, number one is Dan Campbell, Yeah, obviously. of course. Well, you've already made be. that clear. It Thank has you. to be, right? It's a career <laughs> achievement award here. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I do feel like if they were to give him a lifetime contract right now, I'd be right. like, that's fine. What if it falls apart here at the end? That's going to be interesting. Like, what that if would it starts not, to get No, that would dicey. be sad. That dicey. would not be interesting. Uh, yeah, it would be <laughs> dicey. But I, I did see someone in Detroit tweet this because there are a lot of people in Detroit right now complaining with how the defense is looking and being yeah. like, ah, oh, it's falling apart, smoke and mirrors on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah. And that is true. It, right. it, is, it is troubling on the defensive side. But, but he, was, he was saying, and this is, this is speaking reason into the conversation, he goes, you have a t- defense that is not very good. That is true. And you're 9-3 and three right now. Yeah. yeah. Listen to what you're saying, right? Yeah. You're, you have nine wins in a year where you're rooting for the Detroit Lions and they don't have a great defense. That is a win in a lot of people's books. No, no, you're right. Well, it, it shows that they were team. able to overcome that. Um, yeah. And, yeah, I mean, the defense was, was solid early in the year, but now it's, it does seem like it's falling apart. And good thing their offense is pretty elite in all areas to where they can – put you in some tough spots our former nbc colleague caitlin urka chimed in said dan campbell she oh, i mean she's I knew a that. Fan too. i knew that a she's lion. like you she's a wolverine and a lions fan <laughs> the lions have had a remarkable turnaround and he has the entire state fired up and believing i haven't been this excited to be a detroit lion fan since barry sanders was in the backfield wow. that's true i think this is more exciting too. than that era i really do <laughs> i mean he was the most exciting thing ever but i think this era like i can remember being 10 and 11 and being like the lions are going to the Super Bowl. I don't care. You know, like you knew they weren't. You never felt like that. You know, this team has a little bit more, I feel like, of a overall chance than than maybe those teams. They're still growing. They got cap space. They got draft picks next year. I think they're next year is really the year. Exactly right. I do think that actually is true. Yeah. You know, it's like this year they're proving to themselves that they can be a playoff team. Need another pass rusher. Need another secondary guy like we've discussed many times. Uh, My number two is uh, is Shane Steichen. And there are a lot of the homies out there that wanted to give some love to Shane Steichen. You've already done it here. Yeah. He's the the stick man per Jay Croucher. What does that mean, Pete? I see the AKA the stick man. What would that mean? The, st- the stick man. I don't know either. Wouldn't it be the stike man? I don't. 
That, maybe that's maybe that's what he's trying to say. Maybe Sorry. Jay was trying to say Stike, and in his Australian accent, it sounded like Stick. And we were just like, "All right, cool." Like he did with me on the like draft Cody podcast. Mark, Cody, Cody M- Mark, Mark, and, and you, I was like, "You go, he's one of the under the radar guys." You're like, "I didn't, I didn't, I haven't watched scouted him Cody at all." Mark, I don't know who Cody Mark is. <laughs> he's just flipping through your notes. <laughs> I like, really, yeah. oh, that was so so stressful. I was like, "Oh my gosh, I missed a quality offensive lineman in my drop my my breakdowns." Uh, Bernardo Banos, his number one is Shane Stike. And he goes. He's seven and five with Gardner Minshew. Uh, let's so let's go back into the notebook here a little bit because okay. you did take a look at the Colts offense yes, a little did. bit more, right? Yeah. So yeah. a lot of people are saying Shane Steichen here, and and you've complimented him for the last five weeks, or probably even more than that now, from what you've seen. You dug into the offense though more than you have in the past. Yes. What were some of the things that stuck out to you about what he's doing and what they're well, able to do? On well, that listen, I, I'll make it clear. I know I said my top three or whatever, but I would have no problem with Shane Steichen. You know, one coach of the year. It's he is. Every bit worthy of that. You know I think the world of him. I think it's one of the best offenses in football, right? I think that that's how I look at it. And, again, I don't know, and I know I wrote this down at one, in one spot of my notes, I don't know where their motions and their shifts and the things we talk about, right, and all that that they do, but – it's up there with the 49ers or the Dolphins as far as, you know, that movement and stressing a defense out. I don't know if it's right there with them or if it's a little behind. I don't look up the stats, but I know because I watch these guys a lot. They got a good old line across the board, right? They got a creative scheme, run game and pass game, right? And to like what we showed earlier with Shannon and the 49ers knows how to tie plays together. Hey, here's this. Hey, here's this. Oh, it's a fake this and there's that, right? He's great at doing that. He's got tight ends and wide receivers who are willing to block uh, big time uh, and, and get involved in the physical aspects of the I game. I love that. I oh, love a team that has that. They got multiple tight ends, and then you got a guy like Alec Pierce and Michael Pittman who are tough SOBs for a wide receiver. And, of course, Michael Pittman is. I played with his dad. They don't get any tougher than the Pittmans. I can tell you that. What about the tight ends, too? Because you did make note of them. You got, what, 83? That's Kyle Kyler Granson. Gray, yep, right. And Grayson. then you got uh, Drew Ogletree, Drew, 85. They, they got some juice. I mean, you look at them and go, they need to be – involved in the pass game a little bit more in their offense, right? Pierce and Pittman are, you know, really good. Pierce is a guy that can take the the top off of defense. He's got that type of speed. Pittman can do that, but also is awesome in the intermediate, tough catches over the middle, break a tackle, do all that type of stuff. But, yeah, these tight ends, you know, a little bit like we talked about with the 49ers, they could put some people in some binds where, hey, we're going to get big, we're going to run the ball, right? Oh, no, now they're split out of receiver. It's an issue for you guys. Not, a, not to, you know, to mention Mo Ali Cox is a part of the group too who's just yeah. a giant human being that can do both. So there, I, I feel like in reading your notes, you yeah. think – in watching them and going through the film, that they have you've, – you've liked Pittman, you've liked Alec Pierce for a long time, but you think there might be even more offensive talent than you had previously thought on that side yeah, of the ball. Yeah, I think that, you know, the rookie downs has come through in big, big time. The O-line played bad last year, you know, so I wondered, oh, man, are they coming to the end of their shelf life a little bit? They're not. They're still going strong. And, and I think Steichen and his, you know, v- vast array of run plays – Helps them out, let alone I think he knows how to, you know, put the poker right, you know, on the butt there and go, hey, we got to get going. You got to play harder. You got to be more physical. All that, you know, they got a wide receiver screen game that also like if you overplay their runs, hey, whoa, we'll smash you all in there. We'll throw it out in the edge and get five, eight, ten yards on a wide receiver screen. Um, But yeah, like. This is a league li- league wide problem a little bit. Ooh. Uh, it is. It is. And there's another point here later on that, that I want to bring this bring this out in the conversation too, but maybe now is the time. But either way, yeah, they th- if I have one complaint about their offense is they need to throw the ball down the field a little bit more. Now Gardner Minshew doesn't have a big arm and he misses a few plays down the field every game. I get that. But their offense is so damn good. The only thing I look at is just they got to back people off a little bit every now and then. And Pierce runs by everybody. Everybody. I mean, it's it's amazing to see a white guy run that fast, you know, for lack of a better way to say it. Yeah. It really is. And I think that sometimes DBs do the same thing. They're like, he's not that fast. He's not going to run by me. Oh, no. 
they're, and they're running like, a, you know, trying to catch up. So that is an aspect of their offense that I think it can make them more explosive and help out their run game and their RPOs and things like that just to open up the field like we talk about so much. I want to dig into this a little bit because, okay. you know, I don't know. It wasn't this game that you noted no, it, but it's the, um, what was it? The, was it Rams? Well, it's the I think it was the Packers game a little bit, but okay. it was also um, – hold on. Let me get to it because I, I know. I wrote it right here. Oh, it was the Texans and the Broncos where okay. you saw me right at the end. Right? I said, the league needs to be more old school again, right? The whole NFL needs to throw the ball deep more. I look at too many games every week and go the same thing, right? Every defense is calling the offense's bluff, right? There's too many second and nines and third and sevens where I watch and go, the defense is, they're, they're calling you. They know you're going to, it's third and seven. They know you want to throw it eight or nine yards. They got nobody deep. They're calling your bluff. And teams are letting them off the hook because they want to be efficient. And I came with this play and do that. And to me, you know, I say old school because, you know, when I grew up, there was an era. It wasn't completion percentage wasn't always the number one thing, right? You know, really good throwers, awesome throwers, Josh Allen, Mahomes, Burrow, you know, Jalen Hurts, whatever. When you're that good, the 20 yard in cut shouldn't be any different than the five yard throw. The 25, the 30-yard throw shouldn't – oh, he's open 30 yards down the field. Who cares if it's 30 or who is five, right? And, you know, we've gotten away from a little bit of that because we want managers in the offense. Or, oh, he, he diagnoses so quick to throw the five-yard throw. whoop de do Well, it's, it's so much of that. And then you add in the running quarterbacks that, yeah, I look at it all the time and go, it's third and four. They're playing everybody on the defense five yards deep. And they're going to try to jam it in there for a six-yard gain. And I want to go, F you got this quarterback. You got this receiver. Throw the ball f***ing deep. They're literally going, you won't throw it down there, will you, you chickens? And I think it's a big reason and why points are down, right, is a little bit of that, the lack of top-tier throwers. We've got into game managers a little bit. The prototypical Tom Brady, Peyton Manning type guy is not as much in the NFL anymore. You know, Warren Moon back in the day, right? You know, and I think that's a little bit why we're seeing defenses down. The Houston Texans, and we'll get to that game, and, of course, we're talking about the Colts and Titans right now, but the Texans, like the 49ers do, because Shanahan, he knows, I tear people apart. Like we showed in the graphic with Purdy. He mm -hmm. threw for 300 yards. He didn't throw one ball past 15 yards, right? So those defenses are going, Shanahan made the defense to go, wait, I kill everybody here. Don't let everybody kill us like we, I kill everybody else, right? Remember in the Netflix thing with Mahomes? I mean, the Netflix things with Mahomes playing the 49ers. They were trying to play all the Kelsey stuff over the middle. And he goes, damn, they're not even playing the deep part of the field. He goes, that's disrespectful. They think they can get away with that shit against me. Or he said something like that. And he, they started to throw the ball down the field. Right? So that, to me, is an overarching thing in football mm. right now where the coordinators are too worried about completion percentage, a quarterback reading, and I efficiency. want to manage the situation yeah. and efficiency and all that. And the, the defenses know that, and they're going, hey, we're, we're going to be right here where you're going to try to throw these five- and six-yard throws, and it's making life hard. Yeah, so I thank always you think, for letting me wax no, poetically about that for a minute. I like that, and I always think of that, too, in situations where it's third and long or like third and 15 or third and 19, you've had a sack or a holding or something like yeah. that. Uh, most times you see the coach is just going to do a little screen over the middle yeah, or hope draw, we can break a tackle like, and get, get a few it, yards, maybe, make right. a punt. I, I'm just like, why? Why don't we just throw deep on that all the time? Well, and then you, you might see get Mahomes and Allen, and they right. do, and yeah. those type of guys. Could they get go, a pass oh, interference. Right. Your guy could come down with it. Yeah. And right. if they do pick it off, it's probably just like a punt a lot I, of times. I, I, you know, I got to this a little, and, and, of course, I see it on film and all that. And, you know, I, I of course, grew up in an era of that. You know, I, I was telling the guys at the viewing room the other night, like on a Wednesday night, there's no football on. So I might get in bed at, you know, 1030. And for a few minutes, I go, let me turn something on. So I turn on old football games, right? M mainly my dad's, right? And the other last week I turned on a 1988 game between him and Doug Williams, the Washington Redskins at the time, right? And they're playing a game. And you want to talk about quarterback efficiency? There was none. Hmm. I mean, none. My dad was like 14 for 27 for 280 yards. 14 completions for 200. Like in the third, in this late third quarter. Doug Williams was like 10 for 33 for 340 <laughs> yards, right? Yeah. I mean, so, but there was pressure on the offense and, and you know, it just, there's to me too many 
they're letting the defenses be too over aggressive and take things away. I don't know. It doesn't have to be 10 for 33 like I'm talking about. Right. But there's something in the middle there that needs to be met with NFL offenses. Well, right and you've now. made the point before, and it just makes it so much more difficult for the quarterbacks when you're working in this phone book. Exactly you're right. They the think they're box. doing favors to the quarterback, and you're really making it harder. Um, we've already talked about the the t- Texans and D'Amico Ryans, and there were a lot of homies that want to give him love and had him number one for their coach of the year right now. Finn Sport F says D'Amico Ryans, the Texans weren't considered a playoff team by many if any before the seasons Gregorianism says number one D'Amico Ryans seeing what he's done with that team and how CJ Stroud has come along so fast is a testament to the culture he put in place so he's got his fingerprints all over the defense obviously for them and you say it's a little bit different defense than what he ran in San Francisco, just because the personnel is a little different, can play a little bit more man. The corners, that's it. The yeah, corners right, are exactly. different. The corners allow them to play a little more man, and they allow them to blitz just a little bit more than he used to with the 49ers because he trusts them on the outside. So the corners better. It gives them a chance to do more stuff. Yep. You deep dove into their game against the, the Broncos, and specifically the Broncos on offense, Texans on defense. And while the corners are special, you noted in your, your notes – the front seven for the Houston Texans, not only good, you think they're among the top defenses in the league. I, I think that when you talk about team speed, they're up there with anybody, right? When I turn on Texans film every week, or not every week, but we've had to watch them a lot of weeks for our Wednesday What the F Happened podcast, and I'm always like, man, look at these dudes fly around the field. I mean, they can go. Now, they don't have a ton of size, and that's probably something they could address a little bit, right? You want to find that fine line of speed and size, like the 49ers have again, you know, where it's like the D-line, they got the big dudes in the middle, and then they got the fast guys at all the other spots, right, that, that really help it out. But I think that's the thing that jumps out right away. The front seven speed is up there with any top defense in football. The, like you just said, the cornerbacks allow them to do a little bit more than I think D'Amico Ryans ever did with the 49ers because he goes, man, Stingley? I mean, Stingley can – he can cover some people, right? That second interception was special, special. It it really was, right? Was that not incredible as far as just going up to make that type of play? I mean, that that was receiver esque like type of ball skills. You could probably take some screenshots and it looks like he's beat by a step. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't even really his responsibility all the way. Mm. It was him playing football and being smart. They ran a double move on the safety. It was cover four. So for him not to make the play, nobody was going to be on the film the next day and being like, how come you didn't get over there to make the play? It wasn't really – it's just like he had nobody in his area. He saw the play developing a little bit, and he was like, whoa, I better go help out, and he makes the play. Uh, But, yeah, between him and um, um, uh, Steven Nelson at the other corner, who's damn good, okay, then they got two safeties who are really good against the pass and Petrie and Ward, but, and also to add to that, not only are they good against the pass and have speed, nobody told them that they're small and they shouldn't be able to hit like they do, right? It's like, hey, guys, you're, nobody told you, hey, you're 5'10", 185. You shouldn't be hitting like that. They don't know. They think they're 6'2", 255, right? So they bring it, and that brings something to their offense too. Uh, so I think those are the things. They're, of course – you know, the personnel meets the scheme and they're one of the best zone teams in football, like the 49ers, have a, you know, a master class and how to pass people off and zone certain sides of the field off and understand route combinations and all that, that really make them special and, and that's what I like about that Texans defense. And in watching this tape, yeah. real, real quick, yeah. briefly touch on what you saw from the Denver Broncos and Russell Wilson. It seems like you were underwhelmed yeah. with... Even Ru- though we've talked about an improvement for Russell Definitely. Wilson from what we saw last year. Definitely. You were still underwhelmed by this take. Yes, it was. Well, this was the game where, you know, they figured it out at the end of the game. And I wrote this in my notes, right? You're playing the Texans, you got to throw the ball and be patient for four and five yard games, or you got to throw the ball 50 yards down the field. Like we said with Shanahan and what he did with this defense, he doesn't want people throwing the Debo over the middle for 10, Debo over the middle for 15, Debo over the middle for 10, George Kittle over the middle for 10, right? So that's where it, 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 it kind of lies. It's like, hey, here's a little throw in the slot. Oh, it's second and five. Hey, maybe another few though, but you got to take some shots down the field to back them up. You can't let Petrie be one on one versus Cortland Sutton and let them get away with it. You know, John Gruden used to say that, that we owe it to them and the rest of the league to not let them do this and show them that they can't put a safety on our best receiver, right? He used to say stuff like that. I'm like, you, you're exactly 
Right, they're cheating us here, and we're wrong if we don't take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. So that's what teams got to do a little bit. But Russell, w one of his worst games we've seen, definitely his worst game we've seen here recently, right? Missed throws, watching the rush too much, right? Of course, the turnovers, they were all issues. You know, he had one pass drop downfield, but he missed some, un you know, some throws down the field that he should have had, and some ones also that were open that he didn't see because he was watching the rush. He got a little into some bad habits in this football game. There's no question about that. And that was a little disappointing, you know, because they, they certainly had their chance to win this football game. The number five coach of the year candidate for our guy, Jay Croucher, was the Green Bay Packers coach. We've already talked about him, Matt LaFleur. Uh, but you looked a little bit. We had to, right? I mean, we had to look at this game. If, if you do your notebook session and don't look at the Packers offense and how they have changed and what they have done here, exactly. we're not doing our job. Right. We're not. We're not – living up to the standard that we have set here no. on the Chris Simpson yeah. Button podcast. Right. And so uh, you called this team, in quote, a wide-open, smash-mouth football team. Yeah. For like the Green that? Bay, the like Green Bay Packers. Yeah. I do like that. Uh, so we're going to go inside the numbers with this, powered by AWS as we take a closer look at Matt LaFleur, what he has done, and what this offense is, is turning into. These are next-gen stats. Jordan Love's passing chart. According to the next-gen stats, he generated a career-high – Plus 14.7 EPA, that's expected points added on his dropbacks in the Packers' victory over the Chiefs. Loves through for over 100 yards off of play action for the third straight game. Leads all quarterbacks with 378 yards off of play action since week number 11. So there's a lot of things going on right yep, there. Right. He is playing above average quarterback now. At least he did uh, in the last game over the Chiefs. And so... A wide open smash mouth football team. A transformation of this Packers offense is what you've seen. A transformation. I mean, you know, I should read my quote right at the end. Should I read it now? You know, is this, oh, is this, yeah. Can we know? see it, P, here? Oh, okay. it's on there. Yeah, All right, good. Let's, let's do it. We'll go inside the notebook brought to you by no one yet. We're, we're still working on but, that. But, like, I mean, if you see here in the bottom one, I wrote, the Packers do everything. I mean, even on plays the Chiefs D won or wins, you were like, good thing they that guy got pressure or they could have been that could have been a big play for the Packers, right? They have yep. so many schemes and motions and everything they throw at you. And I just wrote, the Packers O went from training wheels to crotch rocket, we're doing wheelies, uh, you know, down the highway in a month's span, right? <laughs> it was literally like they were pedaling and it was like ding ding we had like a little, you know, the little bell on the handle. Ding, ding. We're going three miles per hour. And now they're like, and they're flying down the highway 150 miles per hour on the back wheel. I mean, it's incredible what their offense over a month. You know, I think the Chargers game was the jump off point. It had started a little before then. I think that gave him the confidence to go, okay, let's start unveiling it. He had a little success. He played good in that game. We think he's ready. And of course, that continued to Thanksgiving and then, of course, the last night. But every time I watch the Packers, I feel like they do more and more. More concepts, formations, way more movement and motions compared to earlier in the season, right? I'm sure their, their, their numbers are not the same as the 49ers, the Colts, or the Dolphins in totality. I would bet you they are the last three or four weeks. I mean, I mean, they have plays where there's motion twice on the same play, three times. It's like, wait, the receiver goes from here to there. Then they motion the tight end from there to over there. And then the receiver who moved from there to there, he goes back to the other spot really fast. They say set hut. You know, they're amazing at doing that. They really are. The offense is a lot like Shanahan and McDaniel. Not as creative as Shanahan with all the movement. Not as wide open as the Dolphins and McDaniel. But based through the grunt and run game like Shanahan. And, and, and you know, of course, I said McDaniel is more through the quick passes, right? Uh, one of my favorite offenses to watch in football over mm. the last month. 49ers, Dolphins, Colts, Lions, Texans, Vikings. I think those will be my favorite offenses to watch. I mean, it, it's it's hard, you know, as I went through it, it was hard not to look at it and go, man, what would have Aaron Rodgers looked like in this offense? I, I, I had that thought many times oh, watching wow. it the last two weeks going, man, you know, man, he just wanted to line up and run slants and yeah, do that. He like wouldn't he, have allowed it. Whoa, he could have done all this. Or whatever. But it's a great blend of – Cool, get on the plays with what you just talked about, aggressive play action passes and smash mouth up the middle, right? 
So, I mean, they got a the reverses and sweeps are part of their game plan every week right now. They got wide receiver screens they get out there. They'll throw the, you know, the thing we saw the 49ers do with Debo Samuel, a toss sweep or a, it's like a lateral pass out in the edge. Let's get him out in the edge. And there's lead block. It's not like it's just like, "Hey, you're in space. Now make something happen." They're getting out in the edge whether it's the reverse, the little, you know, toss sweep or even the the little wide flare by the running back and there's blockers in front of them. So you're going, yeah, this is a space play, but there's two guys in front of them ready to knock your f-ing head off, right? So it's not like it's like, oh, this is, you know, two hand touch football. They're bringing it that way. Let alone they stay patient with trying to run the ball up the middle. Their O line's getting better at run blocking because they're an amazing pass blocking group, but better run blocking. Um, and, you know, with this game going on, they had the, they had the Chiefs. As I was amazed with the 49ers going, I've never seen an O-line do this to the 49ers D-line in pass protection. I, in this game, was equally as going, I've never seen the Chiefs defense have their head spinning quite to the same capacity they had in this game where they were like, wait, check this, oh, check that, oh, no, check back to this. Check. I mean, they were all over the place, yeah. and it caused some confusion, which you don't see a whole lot in that Chiefs defense. So let me ask you there, yeah. then, because that's interesting. Uh, was this a Packers problem that the Chiefs defense had in this game, or are there signs? Signs of regression. I feel no. I don't. I, I think it is a little bit of a Packers problem. The Packers are talented, mm-hmm. right? You've heard me say that is one of the reasons I picked them to win the NFC North before the year. So their talent poses some problems. I think Spags and this one little got into. I don't know what the f- they're going to do. So I'm going to be a little more conservative and. I, to that, you know what I, and what I always like about Spags, when these offenses do everything, he says, F- you, I'm going to blitz this guy here, and I'm going to, you think this is going to be cute, you're going to fake to this guy, and now you're going to sit back there for four seconds, and people down the field, we're going to send a blitz that you didn't prepare for, and it's kind of crazy, but it's going to ruin everything you want to do. I felt like he missed that, and like that tactical chance blitz, you know, that gamble that we talk about that I love that you have to do some against some of these really good offenses I felt like that was a little bit of the difference in this game and two hey they got some injuries on the defensive side of the ball uh and you know they were just outplayed they were outplayed they were out physical and as you saw in my notes there wasn't one standout on the Chiefs defense the whole game except for 95 I mean Chris Jones was literally the only guy the whole game where I went Oh, hey, there he is. Oh, oh, man, that was a play. Who was that? Oh, that was Chris Jones. Oh, man, somebody got pressure on Love. Who was that? Oh, it was Chris Jones again. I mean, so it was an underwhelming performance schematically and from the players on the football field. And that was Inside the Numbers, powered by AWS. Packers got a uh, Monday night football game. Who do they have in this one? They got, uh, they got the G-Men. They got the my Giants My family's actually in this asking me to go to the game. They're like, my son is going, can we go to the game? You went to a Monday night game last year. I know, I know. And I don't have to work Tuesday morning, so it makes it tempting. There Green. is another game on during that game this week. Oh, There's that's two right. Monday There's nights. The two games. Which is a little so. And your we'll reluctance say, is that, do you really want to see the Giants get beat again two years in a row in person? The, I mean, we, we, we come out fighting. We're the G-men. We're not laying down for anything, all right? They're coming here. They better be ready. They better, they better not be looking ahead in the schedule. That's what I'll say to that. But, uh, yeah. but you know, back to the Packers, just a few more things sure. real quick. They have patience with the run game. We talked about that. Love throwing it great, right? And he is really good in the pocket. He's aggressive with his decisions, and he knows where his outlets are. And he, let me just say, he's, like, he's fearless in the pocket. That's what I love about him. He doesn't blink when people are around him. In fact, at times where you're like, damn, you're a little too casual. They're about to strip sack you here. Can you hurry it up a little bit? And he just, he don't care. So he's, he's that's where they're kind of dangerous. He's, he allows things to open up down the field. He ain't looking to be checked down Charlie, right? And I, I think that's his ability to throw off his back foot. He made a number of those again in this game where you just go, it's phenomenal stuff. It really is. You know, but it's it's the it's the reverses, the speed sweeps, the throwing the ball down the field, uh, and the Packers do everything. and And I really went, I, I really like watching them, and they're going to be something to watch here down the stretch. They really are uh, because of that talent we talked about on both sides of the yeah. football. Last thing I wanted to get to, because I was very critical on Gutenkust and how he handled the Roger Rodgers situation, the GM for the Packers, yeah. Brian Gutenkust. 
I do got to give him credit, a lot of credit. You know, one, hey, I, I didn't love how he did the Rodgers thing. I, I understand that. And I understand it wasn't him and the organization all the, all the way to. I know Rodgers and we know can be a little a handful. But, like, he deserves a lot of credit for the talent they have in their football team. I mean, they've drafted phenomenal. I mean, there was parts of the game the other night where you go, man, everybody in their front sevens in year one or two, and they're all damn good and only getting better. So, you know, it's incredible. They are stacked on both sides of the ball, and I just wanted to give, you know, Gutenkus a little credit for, for that. For sure, for sure. He gets credit. Matt LaFleur, hopefully he gets a little bit more credit for the job that he's done, not yes. just this year, but the right. previous years. A name that I'm surprised that we haven't talked about yet in this Coach of the Year conversation is a, a coach of a team that's surging right now, surging towards the playoffs, perhaps. Sean McVay. And the Rams, we got 98 Jun says, Sean McVay, insane how the Rams are still in the playoff contention for a team with a bunch of third rounders. It's insane, okay? And I didn't say this because I knew we were going to get to McVay. It's insane that he's not on the list for Coach of the Year. He's plus, what would you say, Pete? Plus 6,000 right now. 60 to 1. You put $1 on him, you get 60 bucks. The Rams, like the Texans... And even more than the Colts, I would say, were teams that you went, there's no way they're going to the playoffs this year. His coaching has far exceeded the talent they have on their football team. I mean, that's the big thing I would say, right? Now, offensively, they got some talent, all right? You know, when you talk about Puka and Cup and Higby and Atwell and Kyron Williams, you go, that's a damn pretty good group right there. Their O-line is bigger and more physical than years past. Stafford isn't under assault or manslaughter every other play like he was early in his career or all of last year, early in the season, right? But And what I always do with them when I watch them, they're, the word, the phrase I use <laughs> is creatively basic. Which sounds like a backhanded compliment. Yeah, I, I, and I don't mean it like that at all. Yeah. You know, McVay is – it's not like you go, oh, wow, that's so cool. I've never seen that or done that. But he just, again, knows how to package things together, right? That would be the, the one thing. Oh, you play this defense, I have this play called. Oh, you play that defense, I taught Stafford to check to another play, right? It might not be, oh, wow, but it goes, they're perfect plays to run against this defense. Yeah. Well, and something so, positive is going to happen. Which sometimes is even more genius, right, when you can keep it that simple. It, 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 right? For a day in free agency and player movement and, and – Kids coming out of college who'd never heard a play in their life. They just looked over at the sideline and saw a picture of a cow, and they were like, oh, I got to run the cow route or whatever. Yeah. Yes, it is. You're right to that. So there is some beauty to that. Um, but they execute. They run the right plays into the right looks. And you always hear me say checks and balances. He's got a great way of, hey, you're overplaying this. We're going to hit you with that. You're being a little too aggressive here. We're going to hit you with that. Right, like the Puka Nakua touchdown down the middle, 70 yarder. Right, they were trying to play some. Hey, we're gonna scare you with a lot of people at the line of scrimmage. They were really trying to play Tampa too, but he was like, "Well, where you are, your safeties aren't gonna be able to get back far enough." So now it's basically one on one with your middle linebacker, Taki Taki, and Puka Nakua. Advantage McVay and Puka Nakua touchdown, boom, and that's where they're really cool. Uh, they're surgical. Uh, and, and, and when the defense gets sick of it and sick of the, oh, man, Stafford's picking us apart, 5, 8, 10, 5, 8, 10, they throw a haymaker at you, right? That's where they're great. All of a sudden, oh, bam, no, no, now it's Puka Nakua, 70 yards, or, you know, it's Atwell down the sideline for a 50-yard gainer. They stay with the run, right? Uh, they're good at that. And then, you know, like I've said, I think the O-line and, and the D-line are bigger than they've ever been. McV uh, Stafford playing awesome. No negative plays, no bad decisions, um, and 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 in this game specifically, like we talk about, when you play the game, play the Browns, right? Don't let the Browns D win the game, and they never. There wasn't a bad decision or a dicey moment all game long, so they really saw the the picture well. And then you add on Puka and Cooper Cup, can they block in the run game? They got some football players, yeah. So that's the offensive side of the ball, and it's, it's amazing what they're doing. Yeah, you you think they're bigger, more physical, both on the front in the offensive line. And also on the defensive line. The defensive I mean, a team that's had Aaron Donald for a long time has right. been quite physical there, at least yeah, with him. Yeah, they're physical. It's more speed and chaos. Interesting. Though, right? Okay. So now they're like, I worried about, you know, the Browns. Uh, you know, the Browns got a good running game. And I was like, man, the Browns, I don't know. Can the, can the Rams, I know they're bigger up front. Can they stop this? But that was, you know, another litmus test for me to sit here and go, no, they're, they're real up front. You can't move them very easily. And they got some unique... 
you know, unique players that are hybrid type of guys that uh, make them make them special. I mean, l- like you said, they got, of course, Aaron Donald in the middle still, so that that's awesome. You know, the ki- the big kid, uh, 95, um, it's uh, Bobby Brown from Texas A&M. He's 330 pounds sitting in the middle, so that helps, right? And then they got Jonah Williams, who's like 290 plus, and then they got this, I don't even know if I'm saying it right, Hoyt, Hoyt the Brown Defensive lineman, he plays outside linebacker. He's 310 pounds, right? But he's got great hips and moves and can drop into coverage. So between him and then Byron Rung on the edge, it gives them a little versatility up front. Their talent on defense is not wowing. It's good. But they have a wowing scheme behind it. And that, therefore, that's why they're making it work on that side of the ball. Uh, and, and, yeah. and that's what's impressive. And that's why I think Raheem Morris is one of the best coordinators in football. Pete tells us it is Hoyt. You got it right. Although you only so. need to say it once, he said. You don't <laughs> need to say it twice for it. Um, that is true. Um, yeah, Adam Blackall chimes in often. One of our uh, most vocal homies has Sean McVay as number three for him. Uh, he goes, is it wrong, though, to have the – Shanahan coaching tree just in the top three. Kyle Shanahan, Mike McDaniel, two, and then Sean McVay, three. Yeah, no, I, I know. I mean, and, you know, D'Amico Ryan is, it's, of course, right. the Shan- you know. So it, it is, you know. Uh, it's, it, I think it speaks again, yeah, to those guys, the guys Shanahan brought to his staff. He brought people that are like him. Psychos in a good way, love ball, always trying to learn, always trying to progress their knowledge and and do more, and then have the guts to try things where you go, I haven't seen anybody do this, nobody's ever taught me this, but I know football and I'm going to try this out in a football game because I think it's going to work. And a lot of coaches are like that, and that's where I give these guys credit. Let me throw a couple other names out here that the homies have thrown out there to be in the uh, conversation for Coach of the Year. I like this one too. Uh, Ted J. Rowland, his number one is John Harbaugh, number one based on his philosophy of there being no poor plays, just poor execution and players following plays as intended. And Fion NC198 had Kyle Shanahan won, he goes, obviously. But number three for him was John Harbaugh. He said Baltimore a powerhouse and getting Lamar back on track after the contract drama. Yeah, I, I, uh, he, another guy that – was he on that original list we read out? I don't think he was, no. right? Uh-uh. You know, I, I – Again, he is falling under, oh, he won it a few years ago. You know, They're he, supposed to be good. He's supposed to be good. They won a Super Bowl, all that. But, man, made the tough decision. Not only the Lamar drama, made the tough decision to get a new offensive coordinator, right? You know, got rid of Wink Martindale two years ago. And you went, oh, man, does this Mike McDonald really do what Wink does? Yes, he does every bit. So, hey, I think the world of John Harbaugh, I think he's one of the best coaches in football. Dynasty Mad has number one Mike Tomlin. Who else is doing this much with this little? Yeah, I, I, I hear that too. I do. The only thing that I feel like hurts Mike Tomlin is the fact that he hired Matt Canada. So that <laughs> yeah. that, that hurts. Right. It, it He's hurts doing it despite cause. bad coaches, right? right that he uh, hired. That he hired, but is responsible uh, for it. Mike, you know, Mike Tomlin again. I'm I'm always amazed. Like Pittsburgh fans, I want to go. What are you thinking? Yeah. Like you, you got one of the best ones in the game. Just be happy you got him. HTT says Kevin O'Connell has to be top three. Lost the league leading quarterback as well as league leading wide receiver. Still in the playoff hunt. I feel like for some of these guys, it depends on what happens from here on out, right? Like if yeah, if the Vikings go on a run, but there are some signs like the Vikings might not be able to maintain the current trajectory. I, I think it's it'll be dicey. We'll see where it goes. They got the Raiders this week, I believe, right? I don't, have we heard who they're even going to play a quarterback? I think it's going to be Nick Mullins. Mm. We'll see. All they right, have hinted so Josh Dobbs. They, Pete's saying they hinted Josh Dobbs, but uh, agreed with O'Connell, and hopefully, you know, HTT, you've listened to the podcast over the last five or six weeks where I've praised Kevin O'Connell and his offensive prowess and genius uh, constantly. He's the man. I love their offense, and I love the way he attacks defenses and knows rules. It's almost like a little bit of a McVay. There's maybe a few more different ideas in the drop-back pass game, but it's like it, it, at first look you go, it's kind of simple, and then you start to dive in and you go, oh, there's some intricate details mm. here that make them special, and that's where O'Connell separates himself. All right, we close the book on Coach of the Year candidates. We end with the song portion of our podcast. Woo. It is we that time. Like big butts and we cannot lie. The big butt of the week. Oh. Oh. Time to give some love to these Woo. big guys. Some it, touches. There's a couple sacks, a horse <laughs> fumble. <laughs> He's a butt-ting superstar. Woo. Give it to him, Ahmed. One butt cheek. And this is why you're the big butt expert of the world right now. Woo.
Our first guy is not a butting superstar. He's a he's a butted superstar. He's he's been fully he's butted. Full butted. Full butted. Full here. butted. Rams defensive tackle Aaron Donald. What he did against the Cleveland Browns is the second big butt of the week award this season. Also had one week four against the Indianapolis Colts. Led all defensive tackles with eight pressures. Had a sack, which was a safety at the end of the game. Played sixty five snaps. You know I love that. And there's videos out there on Twitter of him just moving back. Joel Batonio, moving him back or making him like whiff a few times and both right right I, I mean like he had some moments in the game right because I watched both sides and we just got done diving in the notebook there where you don't see people do that to Joel Batonio or Wyatt Teller Mm-mm. very often you know and then like there was a few times where Oof. yeah well yeah there's a well, few here's times a photo. well but Batonio went on a few rides like this during <laughs> the game and then there was a few times where I think he was like, whoa, I better be ready here. I don't want to go for a ride again. And he tries to attack Aaron Donald a little bit, right? Instead of like, hey, usually O-line kind of sit there and they just absorb the blow and I'm big and I can lower my hips and I'll stand my ground. And so he a few times tried to kind of initiate the contact. And Aaron Donald's so amazing. He like – he saw him coming at him, he like pulled him by him, and all of a sudden he's on Joe Flacco three steps later, right? And Flacco yeah. did a good job of getting the ball out of his hands most times and not. But uh, yeah, Aaron Donald, he might not be what he was three years ago, but he's still damn good and still one of the best D tackles in football. On the tail end of his career, our edge big butt of the week, mm-hmm. just starting. He is a butting he superstar. Is. He is. Will Anderson for the Houston Texans, what he did against the Denver Broncos, his first career big butt of the week award. He did lead all edge with eight pressures, two sacks, according to PFF and had his first punt block in his career too. He was all over the field for Houston. Punt blocked, tipped the pass, or Stingley got the first interception, right? You talk about the pressures. We talked about it Monday night. His instincts and physicality in the run game, they don't go on the stat sheet. They're second to none. It's up there with the TJ Watts and the Micah Parsons of the world as far as physicality and no regard for their body, right? That's, that's what I like out of those guys. Like I said, there's plays where it's like, whoa, you know, Williams is running through the hole here full speed. You're not in the hole, but he just dives in front of it like he's you know, like saving a kid in front of a car, right? And just like, I'll take the shot, but you'll go down. I know that. I mean, he's just – he's amazing that way. Uh, Will Anderson, the motor, the the explosion, the instincts, they're all top-notch. So there it is. Aaron Donald and Will Anderson. Perfect shots by Kristen here. Your elephant trophies are in the mail, along with the merch and the T-shirt that yeah, we made for you. right. That's sure. We're Coming in any day. As we speak. I, I, lately, you've had a lot of small butts on the Big Butt Award. Oh. A lot of small butts. You're right. right. Smaller hey, butts. Hey, you know what? The smaller butts smaller are performing. Butt phase right now. It's all about performance, you know? <laughs> if, even if you have a small butt, you can still win the big butt of the week. Uh, the week. Yeah, it's a fast man's game, as Pete says here. All right, so th- that song is uh, always gets me going right at the end of the podcast. But we end with, and if you've made it to this far in the podcast, we didn't even tease this. So if you've made it to this far in the podcast, tweet at, tweet at Chris and say you made it to Requiem for a Team for Requiem the first time. And if you do team. that, Pete will like your tweet under Chris's account. Um, so it is the Panthers. They're done. They're out of it. 1-11, they have been eliminated from playoff contention. Uh, we have our homies playoff prediction to know that we do in the, early in the year. So sad to say 65 homies out there are wrong because 65 of the over 1,000 homies did have the Carolina Panthers making the postseason. Oh, you want me just to go into it? Well, now? I didn't. I did. You, Dramatic you, pause. You were you were right about that statement. <laughs> Sixty-five did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. We'll, we'll go to your home in North Carolina or wherever you live, or if your Frank Reich is one of those guys. Who knows? But here we go. If, if you're new to the podcast, we we lay these teams to rest. We try to do it as appropriately as possible, right? Respectfully. Yeah. So we Please do the music. Do. Kristen plays the music, and then we get kind of a little somber. Got to re- respect the dead. So here we go. Here lie the Carolina Panthers. David Tepper kept it business-like. With a tie, he stepped up to the mic. He confirmed what we knew, that he has no clue how to win or say the name Frank Reich. He confirmed it all. He confirmed it all for us right there. Well, well done. With one press conference. Uh, So we lay them to rest, the Carolina Panthers. And now Pete also, because I was working basketball last night, and he was like, I don't know, you'd be tired. You might not be able to come up with like five lines in a poem. Uh, so he came up with a poem, right? But um, it's got a swear word in it, and as you know, I don't swear on this well, podcast. Well, you might as well. It's your first. You did your first today. You might as well make it too. <laughs> I don't want to do that. All though. right, you want to do it? So here, here's Pete's requiem for a team, 
in the voice of Chris Sims. Here we go. David Tepper is very rich, so his coach, he can easily switch. But he watches Stroud and mumbles aloud, the Bryce is wrong, bitch. <laughs> yeah. That too was early, well done. Too early to tell. Too early to tell. Too early on to that. tell. That no, was no. nice too early rhyming to tell. there. Too early to tell. Yeah, right. we it just rhymed say that. the rhyme well. It just rhymed and right. it was too good. Yeah, too be clear. And the Bryce is wrong, bitch, is from Happy Gilmore. That I know. Yeah. That I do. Yeah, know. I don't know if Bob you Barker. really know. Oh, yeah. I love Bob Barker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, you haven't seen Watch any that. of that movie either. Uh, you don't <laughs> I've know. I've seen many parts of that movie. Many parts. So this week, the Cardinals, the Patriots, and the Titans could all be eliminated. So I'm going to be in the in the shop writing some poems here so the cardinals the patriots and who was the other one titans you said is that uh, what you said cardinals patriots and titans wow, wow. okay could all, all right. be eliminated yeah. here uh adam blackhall one more thing to say here he goes i'm pretty sure ahmed was subconsciously on the right track on sunday night the nfc south will not be won by a team it will be lost by three teams <laughs> yeah. that's obviously why he stumbled over his delivery uh, that is true right it, no it team will win the division mm -hmm. Three teams will lose it. No, but we could be headed towards like something like we saw last year. Yeah. Where, you know, Tampa Bay won the division with a losing record and got to ho host a playoff home game, which is crazy. And that definitely could happen again here this year with the, the way the NFC South is. So we'll see where it goes. See if anybody can kind of right. take control. We got Bucks Falcons this weekend. So that'll be a little bit of a, you know, give us a little bit more of a gleam into who's going to take control there. That's true. Yeah. Okay. All right, we did it. That was meaty. I feel like that was meaty. even more information we hit than we all. normally. We, we did hit, hit it all. all. I mean, everybody out there, homies, thanks for listening. As always, we appreciate your participation. And now because you listen to this podcast, you're definitely smarter than any of your, of your other friends in football. No doubt. So it. feel free to parrot me or Ahmed on our great yeah. football takes and studying and all of that. Uh, Ahmed, thanks as always. Wore your cute little blue Detroit Lions yeah. sweatshirt today. The Lions, In honor of Dan Campbell. Yeah. Right? You brought in a horrible energy energy drink yeah. that's got an ugly can how dare you so yeah. bad for you come on you're better than that all right everybody else continue to be better than ahmed <laughs> all right take care of yourself you know where to find us thursday we got the chris sims pft pm chris uh joint picks podcast i'll say again knock on wood i'm kind of en fuego right now with Ooh. picks kind of but knock on wood we'll see if zone. that can continue to going i've stopped thinking so much and kind of just have gone into like yeah. I know these teams don't overthink it. Who do we think is going to win? And then come up with the reasons after that. So we'll see if I can continue that streak. I hope I didn't jinx myself. You know where to find us. Keep interacting. Appreciate all you homies. Have a good weekend. Enjoy Thursday Night Football. We'll see you. Peace out. Clap it up. Clap it up. Yo, yo, what up, homies? Thanks for watching. Remember, subscribe to Chris Sims on Button. Right now, we got Sunday Pod, right? So you can have it Monday morning. We recap all the action. Wednesday, it's the What the F*** Happened podcast. We're going to get deep in the weeds on the key matchups of the week. And then Thursday, I'm picking games with that jerk Florio. So you know where to find us, homies. Keep watching. Peace out. We'll see you.